I love all the questions I've been getting through my newsletter. So today, we're doing another episode of Rheumatology q and I'll be answering questions about palindromic arthritis, how to manage our symptoms while we wait for our rheumatology consult, and why we get morning stiffness. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz, and this is Connected Rheumatology, so let's get started. Okay, so this topic comes from Lynn, who simply said that she's interested in learning more about palindromic arthritis. Palindromic arthritis is a flavor of inflammatory arthritis that is recurrent but short-lived. It tends to cause intense joint inflammation and pain out of the blue, but only lasts at most three to four days. It can happen in one or multiple joints at a time, and when it's flaring, the pain can be intense. But in between flares, you are completely fine and asymptomatic. The joints most often involve are the joints of the hands and fingers, followed by the knees and then the shoulders. Now, this can sound a lot like the flares we can get with gout or CPPD, which is otherwise known as pseudocout. But the difference is that those conditions are caused by crystals in our joint fluid that we can see in a microscope. Whereas those from palindromic arthritis, we don't see any crystals. Palindromic arthritis is a well-recognized phenomenon within rheumatology, but most other doctors don't know too much about it. Palindromic arthritis can often be the first sign of impending rheumatoid arthritis and has been getting a lot more attention lately as we are all focusing on how to better diagnose rheumatoid arthritis earlier. Depending on what study you're looking at, anywhere between 25 to 70% of those with palindromic arthritis will go on to develop RA. Now, that's a big range, which really just should show you how much we have still to learn. Most of those with palindromic arthritis will have a positive rheumatoid factor and an anti-CCP antibody. And although common sense would tell us that the presence of those antibodies increases our risk for developing RA, the studies so far are mixed. We also don't have a good understanding of when the progression to RA is gonna happen. Some studies show it can take up to 10 years to develop RA, although most seem to progress within the first few years. So what's a practical way we can approach palindromic arthritis? Well, first we wanna rule out gout or CPPD. Gout and CPPD are much more common than palindromic arthritis, and so your doctor will likely want to do x-rays run a uric acid blood test, or try to get some fluid out of an inflamed joint. These tests don't definitively rule out or rule in these other conditions, but they are necessary data points that we need to collect. Gout and CPPD flares can cause a lot of fluid to collect in the joint, whereas palindromic arthritis can certainly have joint fluid, but a lot of the swelling is actually in the structures around the joint. So we're talking the tendons and the ligaments, so there really isn't that much fluid to take out. Once a diagnosis of palindromic arthritis is made, flares can be handled with NSAIDs like ibuprofen, colchicine, which is another type of anti-inflammatory medication, or even prednisone if it's severe. Now, you may be asking, is there anything I can do to make sure I don't progress to RA? Well, nothing that's proven. Despite the studies not yet proving this out, I do think it makes sense to consider yourself at high risk if you have a positive rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP antibody, if you have a family member with RA, or if your main symptoms are in your hands. So let's say that's you. There is some evidence that starting hydroxychloroquine can not only decrease the frequency of your flares, but it may delay the onset of rheumatoid arthritis. There are old studies looking at treating palindromic arthritis with some old RA medications like penicillamine or gold shots. Yes, we used to treat rheumatoid arthritis with gold, but those aren't really applicable now because we don't really use those therapies. And there is no data regarding biologic use in this condition. The next question comes from Carol. And Carol asks, I would love to see what to do, and what to do is in all caps, when you're waiting months for a rheumatology consult, when you have pain, have rashes, etc cetera, etc cetera. such a good reminder that there is a real problem getting in to see rheumatologists and we need practical ways to manage that time so we're going to get real practical here this is what i would do in the situation and what i would tell a loved one to do first 
we got to make sure we've done everything within our power to get seen sooner. So how can we do that? Well, one, ask to be put on the clinic's cancellation list. Now, not every clinic is quite organized enough to have a cancellation list, but asking to be put on it is the only way you're going to find out. Second, see if there's another doctor in the practice that has availability sooner. Obviously, this will require a little flexibility on your part as you won't be seeing the doctor you had maybe hoped for. And this isn't some hack or sneaky way to try to be seen by the doctor you really want, but simply a way to get seen sooner. The culture of any particular clinic varies widely. Some clinics have no problem with patients switching doctors within the practice and some have policies against it. And then finally, look to see if there are any cash pay options available. This is becoming more and more common in all specialties, including rheumatology. Out-of-network consults can get you seen sooner and can even be used as a stopgap measure while you wait for your in-network provider's appointment. These appointments are not usually cheap and can run anywhere from $300 to over $1,000. But again, they could get you in front of a specialist sooner. Okay, so let's say these options don't work, they're not available to you. How do you handle your symptoms while you wait? Obviously, this varies widely and it's hard to give blanket recommendations as there are so many variables. My first recommendation is to involve your primary care doctor. Many times, in fact, most of the time, they are unaware of the wait time to see the specialist and unless you have an appointment and tell them, they won't know. I recommend scheduling a follow-up specifically to one, inform them that you have to wait X number of months to get seen by the specialist, and two, look for some Band-Aid solutions for your symptoms. And so why is involving your PCP so important? There are a number of ways they can help during this time. So they can monitor your kidneys, your gut, and your heart while you take anti-inflammatory medications. They can call the specialist to get advice or even get you in sooner. They can give you prednisone if it's needed, and you can talk to them about short-term disability. And finally, if things are getting really bad, like you can't get out of bed, you're having persistent high fevers, you can't keep food down, or you're feeling, or maybe someone else has noticed, that you're getting confused, then it's time to go to the emergency room. Emergency rooms associated with large medical centers often have direct access to rheumatologists on staff who can then get you in their system. And finally, I would recommend to use the wait time as best as you can to prepare for your visit. After waiting, you wanna make sure you have the best appointment possible and although you can't control everything, you can control how you tell your story to the doctor. If you need any help with that or wanna make sure you are missing anything, check out the Appointment Home Run Handbook link in the description box. It's completely free and I built this to help you think through your symptoms, your family history, and all the things that you've tried so far, all information your doctor needs in order to get you answers. This question comes from Rebecca who asks, why do I feel somewhat normal by mid-afternoon? There are many ways I could take this question, but I'm going to reframe it and ask not why someone may feel great in the afternoon, but more why someone would feel like poo or super stiff, poo is the medical term, in the mornings. Morning stiffness in our joints is considered a hallmark of inflammatory conditions. But even those without an autoimmune condition may experience morning stiffness if they have joint with degeneration or osteoarthritis. But even those without an autoimmune condition may experience morning stiffness if they have a joint with degeneration or osteoarthritis. The reason someone with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or really any other autoimmune condition may have morning stiffness are most likely different from the reason someone with OA will be stiff. And those differences are likely the reason autoimmune morning stiffness lasts about an hour while those with osteoarthritis will usually feel stiff for about 30 minutes. In autoimmune conditions, the stiffness is a result of multiple mechanisms related to our nervous, our immune, and our musculoskeletal systems, the details of which we're still learning. In osteoarthritis, the stiffness is related to the joint environment itself. In osteoarthritis, the cartilage lining the bones of the joint is worn down. That worn down cartilage is missing its top lubricating layer, 
which means that after a night of laying down and being largely immobile, the unlined cartilage within the joint can gel together. This can happen after any period of inactivity, so sitting in a movie theater for two hours can cause the same gelling effect, causing a feeling of stiffness as you start to move. So what can we do about it? Well, an easy thing to do is to add a series of stretches as you get up in the morning. Whether it's still in bed or right as you get up, moving the joints warms them up and re-lubricates them, easing the stiffness. You may also find that a hot shower or putting your hands in warm water is another way to warm up the joints. I also like the idea that I'm completely stealing from a patient of mine of putting on an extra blanket or two in the morning to warm up the body. Now, for most of us, we get the best sleep when our sleep environment is cold but this can really leave us feeling super stiff and like wood in the morning. So covering up with some blankets as you do some reading in bed can be a way to ease into things. And don't forget to think about the night before as overworking the hands or other joints prior to then laying down can set yourself up for a hard morning. Switching to an electric toothbrush that has a wide handle or moving when and how often you wash your hair can help with your hand arthritis. I want to thank my newsletter readers for submitting their questions. If you don't know what I'm talking about and are interested in having a rheumatologist pen pal, I'll leave a link to join my newsletter in the description box. In the emails, I give insights and tips and I tell stories from the clinic, all aimed to help you navigate your autoimmune journey. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.